Hello, and welcome to another edition of Cracking the Cryptic. Um, today we're going to look at a different type of puzzle. Um, this is a puzzle from the recent Galactic Puzzle Hunt, um, which was an absolutely first-class um, uh, puzzle adventure, really. Um, so the way it worked is that uh, you could make a team, I think, up to ten people, um, and then uh, puzzles were released to the internet over the course of a a few days and the more puzzles you solve the more puzzles you could access and the idea was to finish as many as you could as quickly as you could and the standard of puzzles was quite exceptionally high um, and I'm hoping to cover a few of the puzzles that are featured in the hunt um, on the website over the coming weeks there's one puzzle in particular that deserves a whole video series um, and certainly it's the hardest puzzle I've ever seen um, uh, anywhere in any format um, and one of the most interesting um, but today we're going to do something a little bit simpler than that this is one of the um, sort of Japanese pencil puzzle style puzzle it's a logic problem um, and you can see it, it appeared in a uh, a puzzle called unusual and strange puzzle collection um, and it's this puzzle here it's quite, it, the the title of the puzzle was Cave Lits, and uh, there were no instructions given, um, and that made it quite a lot more difficult, um, especially as I attempted to solve this puzzle before finding out that you could actually find puzzle instructions for this sort of puzzle somewhere on the internet, in fact in the US Puzzle Championship. Um, so, But I'm not going to make us do it without instructions. Here are the instructions to a Cave Lits puzzle. So let's let's look at this. So draw a closed or a single closed loop around the grid lines so that all the numbered squares are inside the loop. Okay. Additionally, each number equals the count of interior squares that are directly in line horizontally and vertically with that number square, including the square itself. Additionally, the squares outside the loop form a single region connecting squares vertically or horizontally but never covering a 2x2 two two square. And this region can be decomposed into tetromino shapes such that no two tetrominoes have the same shape, ignoring rotation or reflection, share an edge. Now, all of that might sound extremely complicated, um, but actually once you get a handle on it you can start to make some progress with this sort of puzzle and there's an example here on the screen where you can see the numbers uh, are all appearing inside the loop as required and if we take a look at this five number for example in the finished solution you can see you can count this square would be one this square would be two this square would be three this square would be four and this square would be five i.e. this number can see exactly five white squares and that's that's why it's sort of meeting the constraint that the puzzle sets similarly this four here can see this square its own square this square and this square and so what you have to do is to try and build up a single loop shape that meets these criteria and you can also see that the shapes that are outside the loop form uh, a sequence and you can see so this would be the first tetromino this L shape here one two three four all tetrom te tetrominoes obviously have four squares and then that was got to be attached to another tetromino that's not of the same type so this couldn't attach to another L shaped tetromino etc and then you can see this square this can now touch another L shaped te tetromino and indeed it does and then there's a tetromino shape 4, another L-shaped tetromino, and another vertical tetromino here. So overall, how difficult these puzzles? Well, not that easy, but also quite interesting. So what I've done is I've got some software here that allows me to present the puzzle in a way that uh, we can think about how we might try and solve it. Um, so without further ado, let's take a look. Um, now the place I'd start with any sort of cave type puzzle like this is with the biggest numbers because we can see that this grid is a 10 by 10 size and therefore numbers that are in excess of 10 we ought to be able to uh, deduce something from immediately so for example this 12 even if every single 
horizontal square in this row was part of our cave, then that would only add up to 10. So this square and this square must form part of the cave. So that's what we're going to um, and here. I'm going to mark with dots um, uh, squares that form part of the cave, and I'll mark with X's shapes that don't form part of the cave. So similarly, this 11 by the same logic, we can we can do exactly the same thing. We can write in this, and you can see this is having a, an effect on the the numbers above. This five now is is also seeing this square. Now, what else can we do? Well, by the same logic, because there can only be uh, 10 squares in a vertical shoot like this, um, we might be able to do something else with this 12, particularly as it's in the same column as this 4. Now, what does that mean? Well, if it's in the same column as this 4, this 4 could, at a maximum, extend to this square. But if it, it, i.e., it's not possible for this 12 square to hit this 4 square, because if it did, this 4 square would be seeing 12 squares, which is clearly impossible. So that the maximum distance this 12 could go would be to here. Now, if it went to here, it would use up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 squares altogether. Now, even if it went left from there, that would be 9, 10. So clearly this square and this square would also have to be part of part of the cave. You can see we're starting to make some interesting progress regarding this five. We've now got we've now got this five seeing three squares altogether. And then we can do something very, very similar with this ten number, because although this ten number is pretty unrestricted in its vertical column, it's quite restricted by this four in the horizontal case, because again, if this 10 extends 1, 2, 3 this way, it can't extend that extra square, because if it did, this 4 would then be seeing all the squares in this direction, and this 4 would break. So the maximum number of squares that this, this 10 can see would be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six in this horizontal row. Now that being the case, that means we can put seven, eight, nine, ten up like that, which is also perhaps going to be helpful. And it's thinking about this ten that allows us to make um, sort of blockbuster deduction, if you like, because remember that the squares that are outside our cave have to form a single region. So the first thing we should ask ourselves is, is it possible for all of these four squares here, I'm highlighting, to be inside the cave? And the answer is clearly no, for the reasons we just discussed. If all of these four numbers were inside the cave, all of these four squares were inside the cave, then this four would break. So we know that at least one of these squares is outside the cave. We don't know which one, but we know that at least one. Now, if that's the case, let's think about any square down this side of the grid. Let's say this square. Let's imagine and let's ask ourselves, is it possible that this square here is outside the cave, given that one of these four squares is outside the cave. We can pick any one of them. Let's just pick that one just for the sake of trying to explain the point I'm trying to make. Now, we're told that these two x's have to form part of a single region, i.e. they will connect to each other in some manner. Now, hopefully it's clear to you that if that's the case, i.e. if there is an x in this sort of position, then by connecting these two x's together, we will cut off this 4 and this 4 from the rest of the grid. And we know that we're not allowed to do that. We know that there is a single cave that I need to create. So given that one of these squares 
is an x, at least one of these squares is an x, it is impossible for this square to be an x. Indeed, it's impossible for any square that connects this 4 and this 12 to be an x, because for this exactly the same logic that this can't be an x, you would be able you would create two regions. And that is therefore an extremely powerful deduction because it allows us to mark all of these squares um, as part of the cave, and by the same logic, I'm able to mark all of this side of the grid as well as being part of the cave. And remember, if this was an x here, again, I'd connect this x to this x, and I and I'd cut the grid in half. So, in fact, these two squares also need to be part of our cave. I don't know that this was the x, so I need to delete that now. But you can now see I've, I've made a lot of progress just from that sort of meta piece of logic there. I've got a lot of um, a lot of the outside of the grid filled in. And this is where this puzzle gets very beautiful because we can now consider this 3. And obviously if this square was part of the cave, then this 3 would break because we the 3 would be able to see its own square, this square, this square, and this square. That would add up to 4. And that's not possible. So this square has to be an x. Now, if this square is an x, we know somehow it's going to connect to a the x that's appearing down here, because there's a single um, single area of uh, cells that are outside of the cave. So this has to be an x, this has to be an x, this has to be an x, and this has to be an x. All of these things are forced, if you like. And we can also see now that this 11 square is actually complete, because it's seeing the entire contents of row 10, so that adds up to 10 cells, and this cell here, that's 11, so this cell has to be outside the cave. And indeed, for the same reason with the 12, this has to be outside the cave too. And the fact that this cell is an X is important because we can now go back to our 10 cell here and ask ourselves, okay, how could we make this a 10? Well, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Let's imagine it extends the maximum it can here. That would be 8, 9. So this cell must always be part of the cave. And that's really important because, look, that now completes this 3. This 3 is now seeing its own cell, this cell, and this cell. And therefore, we're able to cut off these other two cells as part of the three. Now, the next thing we need to consider is this cell here. And we should ask ourselves the question, is it possible for this cell to be part of the cave? Let's imagine that it was part of the cave like this. How, how could that be the case? And it, it should be clear I think that if this was um, part of the cave, then it needs to connect somehow to this area here. If this We know this is part of the cave. If this is part of the cave, I need to somehow connect these two orthogonally. Now, if I do that, I will always isolate one of these x's. Let me show you what I mean. For example, we go this way to connect to the this area here. This x gets isolated. Oops, let me make sure I can delete these, which I think I can. Similarly, if I go the other way, this x will be isolated. So actually, this sort of checkerboard arrangement, as it might be called, this sort of diagonal arrangement um, around these x's is not possible. This must be an x. Now it's very usual with these puzzles if you have to really keep checking your logic in order to every single cell that you can identify 
as being either an X or a cave part is, is valuable normally. Um, so let's just quickly revisit this 10 and think about it further. Um, now, if this 10 was to extend another two squares here, this would make this square have to be an X because we know that the 4 can't, can't extend too far. Now if this square was an X and this was part of the 10, you'd have this arrangement and you can clearly see it's impossible for this X now to connect to this other X or indeed any other X in the grid. Therefore that's not possible and this 10 can only extend the maximum of one more square in this direction. So if it if it did extend one more square, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. This square would also have to be part of the cave. So let's put that in. And that's useful because, again, it allows, it forces us to extend our x's one further because these x's have to be um, all connected. So they need to escape somehow from this area. And you can see how carefully this puzzle's been constructed, I think, by considering the next logical step, which is now we need to think about this 7 and think about how it may move. Well, it should be clear that it, this 7 can't extend two squares over towards this 5, because the moment it does that, it will force this 5 to see six squares at least, probably seven actually, because imagine if these two squares were both part of the cave. Let's ask ourselves how many squares this 5 is now seeing. It's seeing its own square, this square, this square, that's 3 already, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yeah, so clearly this 7 cannot come across more than one more square in this direction. It could see this square. Now, let's imagine it's seeing this square. So now it can go, it could see, if it went this square as well, it would see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Therefore, this would still definitely have to be part of our cave. So we should mark this square in. Why is that important? Well, that's important. You can see now, I need to connect these x's with the rest of the x's that are in, in the grid. How can I do that? Well, clearly, this square has to be an x, because if it's not these x's can't escape. Now if this is an x we can use another of the constraints that were given in the puzzle instructions which said that they cannot be a 2 by 2 area of x's. So this square has got to be part of the cave. Now if this square is part of the cave this obviously can't be an x because this, this x would be completely trapped. So this now needs to be a cave square and we still need to keep extending our x's in order to let them escape. So this would have to come out. And now this 7, just from that, that piece of logic, this 7 has been completed. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we know it has to come one more square this, this way. It's the only way it can go. And it must, that completes it, so we can then exit off, if you like. This x is now isolated and needs to come out, otherwise it's not going to be able to connect with the rest of the x's. And we end up, I think, with this sort of pattern. And now we need to start thinking. Now at this stage, what I may well do is I might start marking in tetrominoes. You can see if we start at this, this x here, there will, there's a forced tetromino, um, an orthogonal sort of straight straight tetromino that would be made up of these squares. So I've highlighted this tetromino here. Now the next tetromino is forced as well because it must contain obviously this square, this square, this square. But if it contained this square as well, this x could not form part of a tetromino. So in fact the next tetromino needs to be these four squares precisely, like that. So we now know that this tetromino cannot be part of a shape that is this sort of, I don't know how we would describe this, uh, sort of, anyway, it can't be part of this, this tetra shape here. And the next thing we can do is think about this 5 again. Now, 
again if this 5 extends more than 1 in this direction it's going to hit this 2 and as soon as this hits this 2 it will break the 2 because the 2 is only allowed to see one other square in an orthogonal direction because obviously the counts include the number itself so the 5 could extend a maximum of 1 upwards but if it did that it would still need to come across one more so in fact this square must be part of the 5 and that then completes the 5 in and of itself because we now see the 5 is seeing its own square 1 this square 2, this square 3, or 5. So this square cannot be part of the, of the cave and we can mark it off. And by doing that we actually get quite a lot of additional information because again using our checkerboard arrangement we said that if this was, if this was part of the cave um, then completing uh, this would isolate either this x or this x. So this this has to be an x for the reasons that we discussed earlier. Now this square here can't be an x because it would create a 2 by 2 arrangement of x's. So this is part of our cave. And again we're starting to get to the point now where we might be able to create another tetromino. Because we can now use our checkerboard uh, logic on these three, these four squares here. We can ask ourselves: Is it possible for this to be an x? Clearly not, because that's going to isolate one x or the other x. So this has to be part of the cave, and this two is now completely uh, forced because it's complete. So I need to mark off the two like this. Complete the checkerboard here. And then we can do a little bit of what-if analysis to think about this square. So let's imagine that this square was a um, part of the cave. What would that mean? Well, the interesting thing is you can see by the checkerboard arrangement and the fact that these x's need to touch the rest of the x's, that would force this square here to be an x. And indeed, this square would also need to be an x because these x's need to escape. But if both of these x squares were x's, this 4 is now can't be complete because it can see one cell, two cell, three cells at a maximum. It couldn't see a fourth cell. All of which tells us this square here has to be an x. Now if this square is an x, lots of things flow from this. The first is this has to be part of the cave because we can't have a 2 by 2 arrangement of x's. The second thing is by our checkerboard logic, this, this also has to be an x, like that. Now let's think about this, this, uh, this, these three cells here. These are all part of our cave, but they're not connected yet to the rest of the cave, so that they must connect somehow, so this is going to have to come out one further square. And now if this square was part of the cave, this 4 would break, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this square here is not part of the cave, this is another x square. And now this 4 is, can only be completed if this square is part of the cave. And now we can complete the 10 as well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, this has got to be part of the cave, and then we need to put an x in, because otherwise the 10 would extend too far. Now this x needs to connect to all its friends, so we have to put an x here in order to allow it to escape, and we can't have a 2 by 2 arrangement of x's. So this square is uh, part of the cave. Now let's look at these x's carefully again. These 5 x's are all connected orthogonally, but they're not yet connected to their friends. The only way they can connect to their friends is if this is also an x. So we need to extend this one further, like that. And you can see, I think, at times like this, how beautifully this puzzle is being constructed. Um, let's imagine this is part of the cave, just for the sake of argument. Then this tetromino here would go 1, 2, 3, 4. That's the only tetromino that's possible. 
but then this x could not be part of a tetromino, it would be isolated again. So that is impossible. This must be uh, an x in order to allow us to make a tetromino that will allow this x here to escape. So lots of things flow from that. The first thing is this 4 can only be completed. Oh dear, I didn't mean to do that. I don't know what it's done now. Okay, I managed to get it to allow me to do that now. Now this has to be an X. Like that. And we can start to highlight the tetrominoes that we're forming here. Um, background colour, we'll make this one yellow. Now this has to be part of a tetromino, this has to be part of the same tetromino, this has to be part of the same tetromino, and look, look what's going to happen here. These three squares are part of the tetromino. Now, if to complete this tetromino, this square was an X and was part of this tetromino, you could see that would break the rule about us not having adjacent similar shaped tetrominoes. So although this could, I think, still be an X, it cannot be part of the, this three-cell tetromino. This three-cell tetromino has to come down here like this. Uh, make this one orange. And you can see that fixing this, this has to be obviously part of the next tetromino. That must be part of the tetromino. Can't isolate this square, so this has got to be part of that tetromino. And therefore this square here as well will have to all be part of the same tetromino, like this. Oops. Um, make this one yellow again. Similarly, by exactly the same logic, all of these four squares have to be part of the same tetromino. And we're on the closing legs now. There are a few ways I think you can make progress from here. The most obvious way is to note that these, these four cells, which are part of the cave, need to escape from their C of X's, and the only way would be if this square here is part of a cave. And then we can think about this x square that we've identified earlier. Now, if these, this part of the cave here was to connect to the rest of the cave by going through this area, you can see this x would be isolated, and that's not going to be possible. So given that this uh, needs to connect to its friend somehow. The only way is going to be if it connects through this four cell here. So this has to be part of the cave, like that. And that's great because now that forces this four. This four can see one, two, three cells. If it could see this cell, it would also see this cell, and that would make it too many. So this cell has to be an X and this cell has to be part of the cave. By the checkerboard rule, this has to be an X. And you can see that we're honing in on a complete solution now. And it's really lovely that there's a sort of forced unique solution from this point. Um, so for example, we can look at this square here and we can say, what would happen if this square was an X? Well, if this square was an X, this would have to be an X then in order for the 2 by 2 rule not to be full foul, this would have to be part of the cave. But that would mean you'd have a tetromino made up of these four squares. And that tetromino would connect to this tetromino, which is the same shape once we um, 